Right. So uh, <coughs> I'll show you a little bit my view, and I've shortened the title cons uh, significantly. So it's basically uh, like a, a box match, uh, microfluidics versus self-assembly, but of course it isn't, right? Uh, we all have interests in all sorts of areas. And then uh, basically the face on the right-hand side is uh, some leftover from my undergraduate studies. Be careful if you do too much philosophy. In German we say, sich den Kopf zerbrechen, so you make the Gasse la I don't know whether that's the word. If you think too much, that might happen there. So be careful. But I still want to go a little bit into some questions. And one question would be, uh, how is a butterfly wing manufactured? Huh? Butterfly wing is a microstructure, has channels that could be used for microfluidics and so forth. It's a microstructure, nanostructure, color. It, um, if I can get there, it's stable material. The butterfly wing as such has no live cells in it. It's quite reproducible, so you can recognize the species of butterfly very well. Uh, the ease of manufacturing, take caterpillars home and breed them. It's much easier than you work in a clean room lab or you work with uh, Patrick Dappeling or whoever your supervisor is. So breeding butterflies is an easy one uh, and that would also come with low cost. I'm not sure why that is actually okay. Right, so let me try this. This is very interesting. It's doing something in the background. <clears throat> and the next question is what is the blueprint for it? So basically if I had a gene, yeah, that produce my microfluidic device at once, like a butterfly, why not? Yeah? Would be a nice, interesting way. Because uh, <clears throat> the blueprint, interestingly enough, <clears throat> uh, leads to the next question, and actually I just discussed it with uh, Pascal uh, during lunch, uh, how to get from molecular biology to structure, because we all learn in the undergraduate years, you know, how the, how the DNA machinery works, how the RNA works, how you produce proteins, and I'm a good chemist, so basically I can produce it all in a pot and you never get structure. Yeah? The soup looks like a soup, even after all that machinery has gone on. And the question is really how structure is created in nature. Uh, so there's particularly discrete size and structure. I'm not speaking of a crystal that extends. I'm not speaking of amorphous material uh, or fractals. They're easier to explain. So how to engineer this? Yeah? Because I'm now turned more towards engineering, <clears throat> and I would be interested very much to get into engineering of such systems. Yeah? And what is very interesting, of course, and we all know it, it's trivial, yeah? the DNA is not all, because the caterpillar, the pupa, and the butterfly have identical genome, right? It's, it's the same species. Right, <clears throat> so basically the example here is uh, taken from nature, that's uh, morpho, uh, probably uh, 17 centimeters across, very reproducible in size. <clears throat> you can see the microfluidic channels here, so to say, right? So it's manufactured. <clears throat> and if you look a little closer, you see on top of the wing, you'd have even a microstructure, well-defined, produced, and ready to go, very reproducible. And inside each of these little things, you can see where the color comes from, and the morpho basically gets the color from this uh, nanostructure there to form interference. Uh, I'm not speaking, not yet speaking of engineering a system that is beyond structure, right? Speaking of structure, this uh, is a surfida, it's a hoverfly, seven millimeter in size, is energy independent and uh, basically controlled by vision. Yeah? It's like a helicopter, it's absolutely amazing. So I guess engineering has still ways to go. Uh, just looking at what nature uh, shows us, okay? So let's go now to compare two things. Uh, normally we compare similar things, right? And I'm comparing now whatever I've done in the last 25 years with a couple of months of one student, yeah? So be fair to that student. Uh, and now starting with the 25 years, what was my comprehension of lab on a chip technology? It's a device <clears throat> made from a substrate using clean room technology, and uh, if it comes, yep. Uh, I targeted mostly chemistry, biology, or medical use. Uh, it would contain channels, reactors, uh, other things, electrodes, and so forth. May contain heaters, 
doesn't have to. And the question is, why is it difficult? Because in the 25 years, I felt like the first chip was as difficult as a chip last year. Yeah? Because you still have students struggling to get those devices ready. PDMS ha helped a little, but I think PDMS is, uh, how should I say that? It's a material I consider like an undergraduate textbook. Yeah? It's educational. And all the rest, I kind of disagree that it's a good product. But still, uh, this is my opinion. Um, if we look at clean room technology, it's expensive. I never had a clean room uh, with a full process in my life. It's labor intensive. It's uh, <coughs> a difficult thing if you make mistakes in your layout. You have to start all over again, so you cannot correct it. And uh, if uh, you allow, let's go through my example, right? And my example means I try to summarize uh, a little bit of the microfluidics experience I had. And uh, that would be the people and the years, for example. Yeah? So you can see here the years. 1987 was the clinical diagnostics department of Hitachi Company, which didn't want to start the project in the first place and then killed it immediately. Right? So it was against what they wanted. Yeah? But they funded me, yeah? so it's actually good. And then it was uh, Siba Geigi, pharmaceutical industry. They owned Corning Diagnostic at the time, yeah, clinical diagnostics, and they worked against me. They didn't want it. Uh, and Sipa uh, Geig is now Novartis. They have a drug discovery department, and actually throughout the years, they were very good at resisting. So there is guaranteed not a single microfluidics device inside Sipa Geig or Novartis forever. Yeah. I don't know why that is. Then, uh, interesting enough, this phase here was Imperial College. It was sponsored by Smith, Klein, Beecham and Zeneca. They were very open, actually, for new technologies, uh, but not necessarily in my lab. They paid all the money to Sarnoff. Uh, and <coughs> oh, wow, that was too, too quick. And basically then, <coughs> so it went on and on. Yeah? But what you can also see that basically, uh, I'm standing here in front of you with uh, some optimism about microfluidics. But I've been in the field probably for too long with uh, quite a bunch of people to consider it a simple, uh, easygoing approach. And if you look at the faces of all my students and people in the lab, and I really show this kind of partly as an acknowledgement, partly as just to impress how many faces actually worked in the area with me, then you can see that I can wrap up quite a bit of uh, different projects, and this is actually about 60 different projects in terms of chip layout and chip designs. You can see here I grouped it all according to the materials. We have uh, glass and glass devices uh, were majority. The PDMS comes second, PDMS glass third, and so forth, and then there's a couple of speciality, which are mainly the three-layer uh, materials. If you try to group the integrated features, how disappointing. Yeah. Most of the devices contained nothing else but channels. Very disappointing, in a way. Metal electrodes, only a few, uh, two or three had heaters, and then a couple of specialities. So it's kind of boring, isn't it? But uh, it was difficult to get there. Then look at the topology of channels, which means how exciting was that whole thing. And you might be again disappointed. The big majority is so-called tree or spider layouts, uh, which has no loops but multiple channels which have like a T intersection or the like. Then a quite surprisingly large fraction of the project had a single channel, nothing else, just a single channel to do a job. Then there were some with one loop, uh, some with a central channel array, some with a central bed that is an open area. And then the, some structures here with a binary splitter and then a couple of specialities. But the majority was very, very simple devices. And the interfaces, basically how is the rest of the lab connected? <coughs> Most cases we had Eppendorf tip, uh, tips opened to the air. For pressure applications we had used a few silica glues, glued in. Here this is embarrassing to me, right? Some chips have never been in use. They, they have been uh, made and not used. And sometimes I don't even remember uh, how they were connected. And I can't find a student at the moment to ask them. Uh, some publications were not made or uh, in a way wasn't sure. Uh, plastic tubing and glue, this applies mainly for PDMS devices. High pressure application would be between flat metal plates. 
Uh, then this one here is Caliper, a startup company in California at the time. They use uh, large holes on the upper layer and that was it and so forth. Okay. Another type of statistics of all these uh, layouts can be according to the application area. You see that most of my life has been spent in separation chips, some in detection, some in chemical reactions, and then there are a couple of minor ones. And what else? Right. Commercialization. So the whole thing represents, again, the 60 different layouts or projects. And you can see that uh, about less than a quarter was in line to the commercial product, which was the electrophoresis on chip by Agilent, the bioanalyzer. Um, some were attempts to commercialize, but failed. Don't like to speak about those too much. And then in some, so many devices were pure curiosity, were fun to do, kind of useless from the beginning to the end, and we never even tried to get in commercial. Right. So uh, let's take, let's pick out the best of all examples, which is of course the one that lead to commercialization, uh, that is capillary electrophoresis. Uh, the scaling, uh, 10, no, 100 times smaller in terms of length as compared to an existing experiment would lead to a time to result, which is 10,000 times <coughs> faster. Uh, target were mainly RNA or DNA analysis and it's actually, it hasn't changed from the beginning to the end. Now, let me show you those different layouts yeah, that I was counting. This was the first layout, and it actually came from an online fermentation analysis experiment, which we called online glucose analyzer, which needed to take a sample, inject it into a larger volume. Yeah? So a small volume injected in a large volume gives a mess normally, but if you control it, then you get an exponential decay and out of the exponential decay of the tail end of the mess, you can inject the second sample here into a stream of, say, some uh, chemical reagent uh, and inject it into electrophoresis. Yeah. That was basically a one-to-one -one translation from that lab experiment. Uh, it has been made here in glass, but it has uh, never been used. But it was fairly complex at the time. Then that was another layout related to see much easier. That one has been used by Chet Harrison during his uh, sabbatical leave when he was in my lab in Basel. Then the next layout looked like this. You can notice that we learned. Yeah, we learned that now spider-like layouts are better than these ones. Yeah? Because if I go back one, then you can notice that one channel here is very, very short and should go from the edge to the intersection. And at, at first we were naive and thought we could make it work, but it's no good. So we made spiders with legs that had similar lengths, and we found that this has advantages, glass and glass device. Same technology, glass and glass for a cyclic system, whereby we would switch in a complicated fashion to follow the sample. Here you see a setup uh, here with the fluorescence detection. And interesting enough, also here, I'm kind of disappointed that these days we never have these kind of slim and elegant detectors anymore. We use entire microscopes. Uh, which I don't really like too much, but somehow it's happening. Then we had an idea or an interest to go into two dimension and we want to go nanometer scale. Uh, a person you know quite well, Holger Becker, is known in the community. He actually spent two full years in trying to get LIGA work and uh, because he couldn't achieve a single device in LIGA in two full years with all the connections I had and he had, uh, I gave up and it felt like Liga is dead forever for me, in a way, but that's uh, maybe not the general truth, it's just my experience. You see all sorts of trouble with surface roughness, channels, uh, nothing submicron there. And uh, actually a device that in the end wasn't used because time was up before the device was finished. Uh, then parallel capillaries and kind of attempts to go two-dimensional here on the Caliper platform, and that's another interesting fact actually that when you get into industry contact, then you stop publishing. So many of these layouts that look like Caliper devices have never been published. I show them at conferences uh, in a more or less uh, agreed way with the company, but uh, I found company and patents actually rather in the way of academic research. And in that sense, uh, You'd have to deal with it in one way or another. That's another approach, channel across here, and then massive number of parallel channels in this direction. 
caliper layout again. Here another caliper layout, open field. We found that this is the best injector uh, for going from this dimension to that dimension. Binary trees to connect to the outside and you notice never any electrodes on a chip anymore. That was also a learning curve. And if you go for some results in this case, uh, we could do proof of principle for electrophoresis on chip, of course. And if I get the next one, it's kind of interesting, sometimes it doesn't want to come. Don't you find this interesting? Yeah, okay. Because it's kind of screwing up. Let me go back one. No, I can't. So sorry. Somehow interesting. Can't get that slide ready there. Okay. No? Oh, sorry. Don't worry. It's kind of messed up. <clears throat> so basically, this layout is complicated layout which would mimic an actual need we had in a fermentation control was never even put to work. Don't ask me the exact reason, because some of the reasons I forgot, and we were probably just not brave enough to run this, but today you could probably run these sorts of systems with a dilution unit, double inject, no, actually three injection units and CE, and I would be, to some extent, tempted to go back to some very old layouts and try to mimic them and, and uh, see whether they worked. That was early results, as Chet Harrison presented it in 91 at the Transducers Conference. We were happy to see uh, this channel fluorescing and this was not, so that was good enough at the time, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> life is so much harder these days, you can't publish this anymore. <clears throat> First few electropherograms obtained with that uh, clunky, big and fat device. Then uh, later on we got better, the spider layout had some really decent uh, efficiencies in terms of plate numbers and uh, any separation is compared to extractions and number of plates of extraction model. Uh, a, a slightly modified device was used for actually uh, phosphorothioate separations. That means basically DNA here is just a repetitive injection. You see time scale, and we've chosen on purpose a thousand seconds because that was uh, roughly what capillary electrophoresis at the time was uh, considering as a very fast capillary electrophoresis separation. So I showed them, look, in your fast separation, we can do that much, and so forth. So this is switching uh, outlet here basically to extract from a separation some fractions depending on the switching algorithm. Then the cyclic separation was documented as well with uh, basically peaks coming back when we follow them around the cycle by a sequence of switching. This is a pure compound here. If we have a mixture then it's looking a little more messy. This is A, B, C, D. Then a reverse motion D, C then forward motion AB the next time, right? So basically this to this is one loop, second loop, right? And with a single compound is much easier. The beauty of these cyclic methods is, and I would still love it, I actually have a startup company in London trying to do cyclic separation still, uh, that uh, we mimic a much longer electric field, right? So the fact that we can get here to, uh, what is it, can't even read it, 850,000 theoretical plates with a voltage with only two kilovolt is that we go uh, basically five times through the same voltage, okay? Uh, right, we did some other experiments with those. Uh, I don't want to go too much into detail. Maybe here you can see complex mixture separated. This was uh, actually sample from human urine, they were taste with FITC, and you could basically, from a separation, zoom in, and you would see this. Problem is a little bit the instability of the systems, that's why basically they wouldn't be considered for commercial applications. That was uh, DNA oligomer separations. We played a little bit on this layout with external detectors. What is shown here is basically a uh, holographic optical element, which has uh, the microchip in this location, this is the holographic optical element, basically a hologram mimicking a beam splitter, such that identical uh, gratings could be obtained in this and this location, and by comparing the two, uh, we would be able to detect on a photodiode array any changes in our channel, and you could see that without labeling, we could look at carbohydrates on the chip at the time. Uh, well, right, here again, a less successful layout, went as far as uh, looking at the absorbance across the quartz device after bonding, and that's it, data missing. This data was shown in conferences many times. It's basically firing across 
here and then switching. Right, I'll just show it once more here. And uh, basically, the next layout was actually an earlier layout, which uh, would inject into a random number of uh, parallel channels. But you can see some of the problem is actually a difference in velocity. So we didn't like this layout very much. Here, this layout worked best with the open area. Here is some snapshot in false colors. Basically, time 0, 0 0.5. Sorry, it somehow got lost there because I put them over top of each other. It's a separation of double-stranded DNA. And I believe I brought the video with it. It's an old video that shows sample introduction in real time. And then the, a separation starting. We hit the channels now here. And then you can compare roughly 10 uh, runs in parallel. You can see the differences there. Right, so uh, I believe that should, well, I'll hop, or no, well, maybe I should show the one before there. Chemical reactions. If you'd be interested in uh, chemical reactions, this is an intercalation reaction. Uh, so basically from left to right, we have the DNA separation. From right to left, we have uh, cyber green. And the speed with which uh, these zones here, which are not very well visible, uh, lighten up, that is the building in of uh, intercalator. And you can see how quickly that goes in that sense. And then we use the same device actually for injection of sample plugs. So the, idea, the idea being that this would be separated in the first dimension, then in a second. So we basically could fire, I don't know, five plugs in sequence here with a program. And then I'm moving further down, and you can see it's fairly reproducible. Uh, it's not droplets, it's all water in water, and you have diffusion. So in that sense, it's not as advanced as some of the droplet systems these days. So basically here we're looking further down, I can see the drop coming down and stopping around there, basically. Fairly reproducible stuff, all electrosmotically driven. Okay? So, but everything was quite an effort, and basically uh, <coughs> one issue is eventually seeking alternatives for all this. And particularly manufacturing is one issue which would be uh, interesting to be replaced by something else. Uh, if you look at nature, nature does not need clean rooms. They don't need grant proposals for uh, reactive ion natures and the like. In nature, insects are simply produced. Yeah? Structured approach is probably needed. Self-assembly. Self-assembly alone is, is definitely not the answer, but maybe some combination. And let me look at uh, now some very uh, <coughs> simple experiments. Right? I'm going from microfluidics to a simple experiment, which is done in my lab. And this is uh, take a three-phase system, kind of self-assembly in a way. I put it in quotes because it's not so much assembly, basically. It's more alignment, but it's energy-driven. It's a single droplet, and just that. Nothing else but a droplet. Yeah? So basically what we have is a glass surface here. We have a water droplet. You can see the contact angle. So the glass was coated. And you see an oil droplet that shows a different contact angle. And the whole thing is concentric. Yeah? So basically, very simple alignment. Uh, this was put on a MEMS device for heat cycling. And we're actually using such devices at the moment in our lab for PCR machine. You can see here the uh, electric current, the temperature measurement, and the fluorescence response of a single cycle. And here that's an entire PCR sequence where we went for uh, detection of uh, reverse transcriptase uh, <coughs> RNA of a virus. And you can see in the middle here, this little blip, that is actually the relevant trace. And here somewhere we go through the threshold, that means eight minutes to detection. And because we are Korean Institute, we have to think commercial, and we took the footprint of a Samsung phone, basically, said, okay, we'll do real-time PCR. So at the moment, we are working to uh, get this fully functional. This is a display. This is the chip for four droplets, and underneath, we do have uh, microscopy elements implemented to do uh, fluorescence imaging of those four droplets in real time. Okay. We use the same thing also for sample prep, and I'll show you two quick examples uh, with this droplet. So this droplet has uh, not only a symmetry, which is nice, but it's also fascinating 
because we can do an experiment, we actually noticed that during PCR, the droplet never gets smaller. And in so many chip devices, we had trouble with the 95 degrees in the PCR that our droplets would shrink in volume because of evaporation phenomena. So this is not covered by anything. It's really just like this plate here and the droplet on top. So we would expect it to get smaller. And uh, we actually found that we observed no boiling of aqueous solution of this one here at 240 degrees for more than 30 minutes. The volume didn't get smaller, right? And uh, this phenomenon is known as superheating. Don't try it on a meter cube, right? Or on a liter of something, because if the whole thing suddenly pops, it's not very nice. Yeah? <laughs> if this little droplet pops, who cares? Yeah? So, safe. And at the moment, we are limited by the thermal decomposition of the surrounding oil. And actually, yesterday, I gave a similar talk, and I uh, got some guy who said, ha, I have something for you, some oil that goes to 700 degrees, mineral material. And we use it basically as an energy pulse to open up spores. As you might know, spores are quite uh, resistant against uh, drought, against toxic substances, aging, heat, and so forth. And uh, we've tried. This is just some raw data, cycle number here, fluorescence in logarithmic scale. The positive control was the black curve. The negative control is the red one down here, right? And then these two are coming from uh, spore solutions. You can see we were not perfectly tidy, but uh, still we see an improvement. And I guess we also were not exactly the positive control because we start destroying the DNA as well, of course. Yeah. So uh, we also looked into something that normally is done by mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry would eventually uh, fragment proteins to smaller fragments. We took uh, such a peptide sequence for test. <clears throat> and uh, what we did is basically expose it to superheating and then see what fragments we got. So multi-TOF would give this whole spectrum. Here is zero, here is the molecular mass. With no heating, we see mainly uh, these two peaks, right? So this probably uh, is probably doubly charged. Uh, <clears throat> after superheating, we start seeing fragments, right? So it seems to work roughly. But we are working on this. Uh, the idea is to have it as an application. Right. Ready for a challenge. So let's put it this way. Here, I mean with a challenge that either you have a good idea and you don't tell me, hide away, go and try it. Or, you, or we could actually get into business and try to do things together. And the challenge would be the following. Can we manufacture an object which, no, yeah, which I can hold with my hand? Yeah? Starting from smaller parts which I cannot hold with my hand. That means micro nanoparticles. I want to start with molecules, with nanoparticles, nanoobjects, because I think nanotechnology is rather useless at this stage for objects which I can hold by hand, because they're producing either a lot of the same, but it's not necessarily having the same type of structure as uh, we see in nature. Self-assembly structured approach would be nice. And now let me just go into that one student's couple of months work, uh, what you put together, and obviously the <clears throat> organism is structured. We go from atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissue, uh, and so on, all the way to organs and the entire individual. We can also look at it from a different way, yeah? perspective, child. You get Lego. Hooray! Right? And then you can start building from that. It's uh, actually not so hierarchical, right? Because a kid would do that. If you're crazy enough, adult, you might go for this, right? <clears throat> or if you're football fan, you might go for this. It's made from Lego, right? But it's the wrong approach because this is not hierarchical. I guess somebody was just patient enough to sit there uh, 10 to the, I don't know what, seconds to build this. Yeah? So structured approach uh, would be, of course, helping. And of course, there's a lot of publications out there on self-assembly, so I don't claim that I had any priority on any of uh, these things. But you see very often self-assembly leads to ordered structures that extend, uh, ordered or disordered structures which show some assembly and so forth, or structures that remain small, like I, I like these uh, origami structures very, very much, but uh, so far they haven't really gone too big. There's all sorts of interesting things out there, but uh, let's just look at the simple concept of what we've taken uh, with that student. 
uh, use of hard material to start with and uh, basically try to achieve an asymmetric pattern by some lo logical sequence. I was speaking of hierarchical structure yeah, and then we need some sort of a morphology <coughs> to assemble. <coughs> so basically we need to f define geometry in one way or another. Uh, we decided to go for capillary force as a driving force because it's cheap and everywhere, so to say. Uh, and we decided for tripods because tripods offer three directions, right? And we would assemble at a fluidic interface because we've seen that several times. There's actually insects walking across the water uh, or you can take George Whitesides who had some gears on, uh, on the interface, uh, fluid to gas or so. There's many different uh, examples there. Uh, the lateral capillary force would be like that. You would have a tripod or whatever object on interface between air and water, and you'd have a meniscus which holds this object in place. Technically speaking, it can be heavier than water, and it will still stay there because the meniscus uh, is a force that keeps it in place. And what is even more interesting is we can get capillary attraction uh, between relatively big objects, which is of interest to us uh, because we wanted to have some sort of an assembly uh, mechanism and uh, it's to do with the meniscus here which is changing and then totally eliminated, right? And this can be shown on the macroscopic level here, it's taken from YouTube, so it's uh, trivial stuff that uh, I guess everyone can repeat, we didn't want to repeat even. So here you have two halves, here two full size objects. You can see from the finger roughly what size it is. And they will simply go together and stay together. Sometimes you need to help a little, but uh, as soon as they get a certain distance, they'll kind of go together. So they're not magnetic, they're just floating objects, right? And uh, <clears throat> of course there's a size effect. You can look into all sorts of mathematics, which I don't want to do. Not sure how much time I have, some time left, right? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. So basically, let's look into the logic. I'm more interested in the logic than in scaling at this stage, because how on earth can we do a self-assembly that stops at a certain size? And the cheapest for me is to remember my undergraduate years in chemistry, yeah? open up a chemistry textbook and start mimicking things. So we have these tripods, right? There's some object with three legs. And in this location, I have some kind of a binding characteristic B, and this can only bind to a B dash elsewhere, right? This cannot bind, this cannot bind. If that's a different parameter here, I cannot bind to it. So if I go from such a model, I can build a symmetric type, like anthracene type object, right? And uh, it's not anthracene, anthracene that I'm building, but I wanted to start with tripods to build this structure, okay? Uh, using the mechanism I just explained before, we need six different tripods, different only in the type of binding and not <clears throat> in the type of uh, uh, their sizes. So basically you see here something like three chemical reactions, but they're not chemical reactions. It's basically a tripod with a binding capability A and B, <clears throat> together with another one that has A dash and B. So B will do nothing. A will bind to A dash, and then we basically have this resulting uh, structure, right? Same happens here. We get this structure. Then we take this one and this one, place them down here, add twice this element to get this structure, right? <clears throat> and we leave no chance to anything else, right? It's, it's logic and it's uh, <clears throat> determined. And then basically the next step would be take two of those with two of those and we get anthracene. Yeah? And again, there is no, not, virtually uh, no other way to, uh, <clears throat> to go. Yeah? And of course, in chemistry we know that we can find many, many chemical reactions that can go two or three ways, but in this particular case we can't. And we get an object which looks like the structure of anthracene or more like a model, the model we do from sticks. Yeah? when you are in a chemistry, undergraduate chemistry. If you want to go with a less symmetric type, let's take phenantrene as an example. We need now, instead of six, we need 13 different tripods. And you can go through this, and believe me, it may be or may not be exactly correct, but you can get there, right? And you get only this, not the other one, which is actually quite interesting. And it's at least 
one simple strategy to get to a bigger structure with a step-by-step uh, -step approach. Now, student had to go further. Yeah? He said, okay, fine, now do it, go do it. So we uh, decided to go for SU8 plastic tripods so because of some considerations of uh, density and so forth. <clears throat> the manufacturing was simple. It still was complicated, I must say, because we produced them in a clean room on top of a sacrificial layer and basically filtered the tripods off. The tripod shape was like this and the student, guess what? The student was a mechanical engineer, yeah. not a chemist. Mechanical engineer, if I say key and lock, he comes up with something like that. Yeah. So this is one binding site, this is an identical binding site. Okay? And of course we had all sorts of uh, fears. We had the fears that we have a huge area here on top and at the bottom that they would flip up and eventually jump and uh, bind, uh, pile up. Or uh, that they would uh, kind of bind in the wrong way. So of course the student had all sorts of locations identified for the wrong type of assembly and why the uh, the design was so good and uh, well fabrication already mentioned these are the actual pictures here of the wafer and release the tripod filtration and so forth and then basically we dried them put them under the microscope in a petri dish yeah? so basically you have a petri dish with water and you just throw them on top of it and observe in a microscope what's going on so it's actually quite trivial here on the left you see such a tripod on the wafer not released yet here it is released, floating on top of the water surface. Contrast is not as good, but you can still make it out. And it's actually not the same type, so the a full wafer will produce all sorts of uh, devices for us. And the assembly results were, of course, kind of enlightening. Because what we wanted is something like that. Yeah, you remember? And what we got is mostly something like that. So we probably should uh, have changed strategy totally. <clears throat> but the student is an Asian student, very, <clears throat> very good uh, and working 24-7 uh, and so forth. So he produced a lot of results and uh, <clears throat> tried out all these assemblies and so on, <clears throat> mostly of that type. And you can see that at this stage here we had the round ends. The thickness was always the same. They did not flip up and bond together, but uh, you see uh, basically nowhere uh, this key lock thingy actually worked. Yeah? Nowhere. So the only thing we found is kind of uh, monodentate versus bidentate uh, binding would work. Okay. <clears throat> the reaction was immediately to change the layout to another one. <clears throat> and you can see that uh, it's unlikely that anything works here. That's a broken piece there, unfortunately. But here is the most seen type of uh, agglomeration. Then the question is whether that sort of uh, <clears throat> contact could be eliminated by an X shape. Uh, here is one type, and here is another type. But again, well, sometimes you, you can see roughly what we'd expect, but uh, still, it's not exactly that. And you can also tell that at some point, <clears throat> the student got annoyed to actually put in the key lock structure. We've kind of given up on that one, so it's all straight this, uh, at, at this stage. Uh, here you can actually see some real-time videos, one, two, three of those tripods. And uh, then if you look at these two, you can see how they're attracted and suddenly pop together, right? And I believe there is the next one which shows, I'm not sure, yeah, the next one will show continuation of the story. So we have the same two here mm -hmm. and that one has now become closer and then we will get there, and eventually this gets a double bond, so to say. So uh, it's kind of funny to observe this, but at the moment it's still low numbers of events. The objects are reasonably uh, large. They're like 200 micron in diameter. And uh, yeah, this is another type of tripods, which uh, sometimes happen to bind the right way we want it, but uh, I don't think it's a good approach. Right, I'll skip this because we've seen the videos. So basically a smaller size, we tried also with sonication, ultrasound, and uh, so forth. But I guess the success is kind of limited. So in that sense it's work ongoing, but I guess we completely changed the strategy uh, and we would abandon not the tripods and the philosophy of putting it together, but the way we did it here with the surface tension is probably not a good way. 
<clears throat> uh, another way of uh, self-assembly is to do with lipid extrusions, and part of the story is a little bit older, but I still show uh, some material of it, lipid tubules, uh, reproducible diameter of the tubes, micrometer size, uh, unfortunately the lifetime is somewhat limited, and uh, we all know lipids from childhood, right, this is in air, but what is more interesting is to produce it actually in a fluid stream, so this PDMS, silicon PDMS uh, device as uh, published uh, a bunch of years ago actually, which was meant to be for vesicle production, but then uh, if you'd uh, apply a pressure from this channel across to that, across this sort of membrane, which contains this sort of holes of about three micron diameter, then you would get some extrusions there, right? These are just pictures, so basically we deposit the lipid in there and the lipid will simply be consumed. So what you see here in this video, this is an old video from uh, Petra Dietrich's time, and uh, you can basically see some vesicle <laughs> clusters formed, not very nice ones, by the way, and if you increase the pressure, then at some stage we get these tubes extruded here, right, in quantity. And uh, you can get all sorts of phenomena observed, like straight ones next to knotted ones. The knotting could be that sort of thing. We're not sure if they are wound up, then they can come at different uh, distance between these uh, twists. The twist can be right-handed and turn in this location to left-handed, so I'm not quite sure why we all see all this. And if you wait with time, you either see big blobs forming or some funny clusters. And the only thing that uh, interests me in this is kind of a self-assembly of a messy structure that has some distant similarity with, uh, with tissue or with uh, organelles. And some ongoing work at the moment is about spontaneous extrusion. We didn't like those membranes very much. We didn't like a pressure drop very much. Uh, in, we needed larger quantities of these guys. And we are at the moment still not sure whether we actually have proper tubing or s filled cilia, solid basically. But at least we can increase the surface uh, dramatically by having extrusions on a surface and its soft materials. So what you see here is a porous membrane from the top. I can't disclose too much what's underneath. Uh, but you can see in real time how we get some formation of little worms, right? <clears throat> And the fluctuations is basically some uh, kind of, or should I say that, random fluid motion in a Petri dish. So the whole thing was uh, not very uh, carefully maintained in a microfluid device at this stage. And I believe there's another one there which shows a similar type of array of uh, pores of a membrane and then basically lipids coming out and uh, forming kind of a, a plate of spaghetti or something. Right. And of course this is not very uh, good actually for uh, having a limited size of extrusion. The length of these tubes is defined by the material we provide initially. Okay. So if I come to a conclusion, then basically I believe that uh, biomimetic microfabrication may be a very interesting way of manufacturing because nature proves that it must be possible to do. Yeah? And we do not use it very much these days. Uh, it's still curiosity driven, very early stage, and I'm happy to see you uh, getting into the field or talking to me about it. Uh, and uh, there is a need actually for better or more uh, concepts about how exactly to manufacture specific structures of sizes and shapes and so forth. And I'm again really grateful to my team who has contributed a lot <coughs> to my work in the lab and also in Korea, I run a very small team. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Andreas, this, now this is the time for questions. Yes, you've, you've shown very nicely the superheating of uh, water droplets. Uh, I expect you would have a super cooling as well. And would that be useful? I don't know. That's an open question. Uh, are there things you can do at very low temperatures? Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me put it this way. There is a big, a, a big thing about uh, <clears throat> all these liquid nitrogen storage of biological samples, right? So I guess cooling and supercooling might be of some interest. 
not sure whether it's of interest at the level of an open droplet, because an open droplet is uh, inherently, how should I say that, unstable, so to say. I mean, it depends on, on where you are. You need a lab that is relatively peaceful. You need to pipe this thing on top and it's there. No protection, right? And you wouldn't dream of putting that into a liquid nitrogen or anything like that, because it's not contained, so to say. But what is uh, interesting for us is, of course, the opposite direction to be able to have a, a short time, high temperature pulse to achieve something like a sample cleanup, like just breaking a protein in your sample and so forth. So we, we have some hopes on that side that it might be fine. Plus, uh, if we have a PCR that is based on a droplet and no microfluidics with it, then we need a sample prep which is compatible with a droplet and no microfluidics. Yeah? So we are basically trying to go back to square one, where people with a biosensor or a chemical sensor concepts were, say, OK, I have a wonderful little stick, and the stick goes into water, and it measures whatever I want to measure. Right? So basically, we have now a droplet, and we hope that we find a way that the droplet will do what we want it to do. Yeah? It's like a crystal ball of a... Yeah, whatever. Uh, I, I'm not sure the, the super cooling, I agree, might work. <clears throat> in, in our case, I guess it's two things. One is if you have a clean surface and no kind of nucleation for the bubbles here, that's one thing. And the other thing is I haven't actually calculated the energies, but if you create an air bubble, then it will not be concentric in the water bubble. It will be on the side. It creates some asymmetry, some additional surface tension, it's the whole thing is, is shifting as soon as you create the bubble. And maybe that's also what uh, prevents it. So it's basically like a, a wiper cooker type thing by capillary force. Oh, but I'm just guessing here. Okay. Andreas, from your early slides, uh, you were saying, you seem to be implying, well, let me ask the question. Do you think there's still plenty of innovation left in microfluidics because, you, as I said, you seem to be implying that there wasn't an awful lot left to do. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's put it this way. I, I tried to, to cover, <clears throat> um, well, a big effort in my lab so far for doing actually a small fraction of the experiments that can be done. And uh, I wanted to rather document that it was, well, it was quite an effort to do, and, and if I kept going, it would not get easier that much to me, in a way. And uh, don't misunderstand this. It doesn't mean that there's nothing else to do, right? It, it maybe just means that I should move on to, to answer those questions which I presented here, right? And uh, I appreciate that at the moment there is a, quite a lot of activity going on, actually, worldwide. And um, if I take it at a very personal level, then... Uh, 1993 or 94, maybe I had a quarter of the world production of microfluidic chips in my hands or in my lab, right? And right now I'm one in a thousand or one in 10,000 on this planet. So the question is, it's just a number game, right? I can't be that good in a way to, to, to get back to where that whole thing was. So in a way I might rather look for exotic things and uh, try to do a little contribution on an exotic topic rather than uh, fine-tune, say, some electrophoretic or cell culture type microfluidic experiments. We do have still some uh, microfluidics in the lab, but I can't present the whole lot here, obviously. Okay, thank you. But I'm very optimistic, actually, that there's a lot more coming out. And, uh, yeah. Another question? Um, I have a question um, about the material. You uh, pointed out a uh, number of limitations that uh, people agree, I think, about PDMS. I, I remember last year you said that paper technology, the drawback maybe that the surface is not very well characterized for chemists, it's not the ideal things. Does this imply that the future of microfluidic is still based on glass and silicon? Or, uh, okay, let's put it this way. Pushing perhaps yeah. too far what you think, I don't know. Okay. Mm, let's put it this way. There, there is always uh, kind of an opinion you have in a lab because uh, you are kind of the boss and you saw certain things and then you define the rules because you tell a student what material to take, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I still stand by my comments about paper because paper is like if you take, I don't know, 
uh, vinaigrette or something instead of uh, HCL, it's not so well defined chemically and I would keep my fingers off things which are not well defined. I would start with well defined things just to make your life easier. And paper may sound cheap, but in fact it won't be cheaper than a piece of plastic. Yeah? Trust me. And uh, it's, it's funny to use paper because it's porous, but you might as well use any other material that has uh, porous properties and uh, is hydrophilic, for example, to do the wicking trick. The wicking trick and the folding trick is very nice. Uh, things like that I really appreciate. And um, the thing about PDMS is, uh, well, documented by a very simple statement. If I look at analytical chemistry, the ACS journal, I'm, you have to close your ears now. Uh, <laughs> the... Basically, the best cited few papers would cover all PDMS, right? And interesting enough, it's a mix of papers using PDMS for the extraction of organic molecules from water. Yeah? It has gotten very high citations in a few papers, and it's a very, very good extraction medium if you want to take all the organic rubbish from water. And then on the other hand, you find some uh, kind of us and white sites uh, type uh, PDMS devices that also have very good citations. And we consider them as walls, PDMS walls, right? But they're actually not walls. So they are having a, uh, an extraction purpose, so to say. And it's a time scale that makes it possible to use because maybe the extraction needs longer time than uh, whatever we do on them. So in that sense, as I made a comment, I consider them very valuable as an educational tool. Probably almost 100% of my PhD student have done a PDMS device first and then Expect, uh, experienced some disappointment and then we got to glass, to silicon, to other polymers, whatever. But it doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad what is done in PDMS. One just has to be careful. PDMS is well defined chemically. Yeah. Thank you. Is there another question? No? If not, then thank you very much for this uh, talk. <laughs> but, uh,